Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce you, our second speaker of uh, form, uh, Ophir Frieda. And uh, he's going to talk, as you see, about uh, computing medicine. Now, you can read about uh, his uh, academic things where he went uh, to the school. And he happens to go to a good school called University of Michigan. Uh, but after that, uh, I'm not very sure what he did. Uh, and uh, I will not talk about those things. He had been chairman and fellow and all that kind of thing. But the most interesting thing that uh, I know about him is uh, he really is a very curious fellow. He tries to uh, do very interesting things. He tries to do things that uh, he finds uh, most other people will feel they are at the boundary and uh, they are not interesting. He finds those things interesting and he starts doing that kind of thing. And that's why he is a professor of uh, biostatistics and uh, things like this while he graduated in computer science. And uh, he's also, of course, professor of computer science. But uh, in addition to being involved in research, he gets involved in uh, startup companies. And uh, when you talk to him, sometimes you start feeling that he's really a lot more excited about making things that are going to be used. And that's why he belongs a lot more to startup uh, the type of atmosphere. And uh, this area that we are uh, trying to talk and build here on the future health is exactly that area. We want uh, people to be looking at uh, very interesting things, trying to make things that will be used by people. So I'm looking forward to a good talk. Hopefully you don't disappoint me. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Ramesh. Well, usually, thanks. Um, I have a set of talks that I usually give, um, and they usually can. Uh, in fact, some of them I've given it enough times, and you can find different versions of them on uh, YouTube, uh, all over the, the place. And those are easy to give, because I just say switch on, and the computer does it, and I wake up 45 to 55 minutes later, and I'm done. And I don't remember the beginning, and I don't remember the end. But when Ramesh asked me to come and give this talk, I said, OK, this is a talk for the Institute of Future Health. So I need to come up with something that deals with health. So I basically looked around at other things I've played along with. Uh, the only slide I could really count on really was this slide because it was done by somebody else. And I kind of use it. I guess I didn't do a very good job because I didn't even set the date correctly. Um, but I decided to master and say what is, I was going to talk about computing medicine. So this really isn't a talk but it's really three talks. And the reason it's really three talks is it's a conglomeration of three different efforts spanning a long period of time a, of different ilk. Now, before I start, I'll give you my view of research and my view of computer science. The truth is computer science really spans the gambit and whatever my activity spans the gambit of engineering to research. And I'm not telling you that there's no research in engineering and there's no engineering in research. But in reality, if you actually go to the spectrum that talks about engineering, it's really how can you build something that actually you know how it does it, you just need to go and just do it from, from start to finish. And, and you know it's going to succeed because it's engineering, it's well done, it's tested and proven. On the other end of the spectrum is research, in which case you hope it succeeds, but you probably are going to fail, and if it's really good research, you have no idea if you're going to fail. You hope not, but you might. So today I decided to choose three different topics, and they span the gambit from the most engineering, which is really simple engineering, which is on basically urinary tract infection processing, to research, and therefore that's been deployed, to research which is surveillance of disease outbreak. Well, the reality, some of it has been deployed. But before, and in the middle of it, I'm gonna talk about discrepancy in radiology reports. So, um, all three efforts have been deployed to some level. Uh, some are in prototype stage, 
like the discrepancy for radiology and the surveillance for disease outbreak. Some of them have deployed into practice in various different hospitals. All three of them are at different hospitals, by the way. So I'm a computer science professor. Um, I work with people that compensate for the lack of knowledge that I have. So this is a joint effort between the people who actually did the work and the one of us who's talking about it. Um, we've got people who are radiologists, which is the MedStar. We've got people who are in research in student MedStar research. And of course, faculty members and students in the Department of Computer Science. So what am I gonna talk about? Well, let me start with an outline of what we're talking about. I'm gonna tell you about the motivation, the framework, the evaluation, and the conclusions. So what is the effort? I'm not a medical practitioner, but I do know that when radiologists, radiologists read the information, it's usually the resident or the, the, that basically does most of the initial readings. They look around, they come up with great ideas, they write great reports, great radiologists, and then it goes to the attending, or there's a radiologist, a key radiologist, and then he looks in, the, or he or she looks in and says, ugh, what are you talking about? So that what happens is you've got the initial report, read by the attending or the residents, and you've got the actual final report read by the person in charge that basically comes around. And ideally, you'd like the initial report and the final report to be the same, but it never is. It never is because, there's, because it's a matter of either style or a matter of error. Now, for those of you, how many of you are actually practicing physicians here? Okay, you guys are gonna hate me. But you know what the, one, the third leading cause of a death in the United States in medicine? Errors. The number of errors that occur every, it's a thousand errors roughly a day that happens in the United States of medical errors. Now, not all of them are leading to death, obviously, but medical errors. So one of the things that you want to try to do is find automated ways of preventing medical errors. So can you get the, both of these reports to be the same in such a way that you know that you've got it read correctly? So here's an example of an initial report. I'm not going to try to explain you what it means because I don't really know. But you can see that they're quite different from one another. And therefore, the question of the report is, is it because somebody had a significant level of errors? a significant level of understanding and misdiagnostics, or is it because of stylistics? Two people write the report, they're gonna have different styles. So in this case, it's no problem. They're the same report, but the report is basically a matter of style. So one person likes large amount, one person just, uh, without it, it didn't make any difference. The problem is that there's a lot of reports. There's a lot of radiological reports. And the, and the goal is that you'd love everybody to read them all, but the truth of the matter, you just don't have time to do it. So you want some kind of way of doing it in an automated way. Again, topic of computing medicine. So the question I have is, can you find those reports which are significantly different and therefore prevent it from causing an, an error? And the basic thing is the state of the art. This isn't a new problem. What they've done typically is they basically did the standard approach, which was called word differences. So if going back, uh, if going back, you would look at, where am I here? Never mind. If going back, you'd look at it and say, are the reports the same? And if it was minor difference, no big deal. If they're more serious, it is an issue. The wording differences has a problem. Because wording differences can be detected, it can either say that your style is different. If I describe something, it's gonna be different than if Moss describes something. But even if it's, it's the same concept, then you're fine. But the wording difference is not gonna be able to do it because many wording differences are purely from stylistics. So the goal was, we're gonna come up with an automated way of doing it. So today, the big buzzword of all um, computer science. How many of you are computer science grad students? How many of you want to get a high paying job? None of you. Ah, one of you. You must be a faculty member. Uh, but computer science is a big buzzword of today, and as soon as I say it, you'll know it very quickly. The first word is deep. What's the second word? That's the end all solution to everything nowadays, except for the fact it's not new, and it's not an end all solution. It's just the fact that all of a sudden we actually have far more data 
and we have far more computing, and therefore we now have more layers. But the point of the matter is that you have to learn. So what we did was define, and it's a classifier. So what we decided to do is to create a classifier for to be able to differentiate between good, in between the initial report and the final report and to tell you if it's good or not. So what we have is we have 350 reports, which were as our training data set, that were labeled. Um, and we have, the report has really two components. One of them is called the findings, one of them is called the impressions. To make a long story short, computer science is not the only one that names different vocabularies on and on. Finding simply is the full interpretation and impression is what you think it is. So it's a good guideline. So the approach, the easiest approach to do is to take something called a radiological uh, lexicon called Radlex. It's a well-known vocabulary. And basically say, are they using the same known vocabulary words? Because basically what you're doing is extracting the essence of the term, of the document that you care about, the two reports. So if we have the same Radlex vocabulary, and we don't have negations, because in case you stick the word no, it makes quite a serious difference. So if you don't have negations, and you have the same vocabulary, it's fine. So we built that very simple heuristic, and we said, if this works, we're all golden. So we evaluated it, and we were actually quite happy. Because what we had was we took two human assessors, and we took Radlux, and we compared the reports, the initial and the final. And of course, Radlex with Radlex is perfect. But if you actually look at Radlex with a human A at a 0.96 agreement, and a Radlex with human B at 0.94 agreement, and to make you even more comfortable with that Radlex is really good, if you look at the two humans, they couldn't agree as well as a computer could. So if the two humans, if you look at human A and human B, they agreed at 0.90 oh, accuracy. And the, so we said, wow, we're happy. So sure enough, we were happy. That was for the non-significant ones. Then we said, let's look at what happens with significant ones. Well, there's a problem. Because the humans still agreed. In fact, the humans agreed more with each other on the, di on the significant differences than when the non-significant differences. So, if, so they, we were, they were happy. But our heuristic doesn't work very well. In fact, our heuristics work rather poorly. So if in the case, if it turns out if it's non-significant, if it's non-significant, we were happy. But if it was significant, we were unhappy. And that was a problem. Well, I'm an engineer. And what do you do if you're an engineer? How many of you want to graduate quickly? What do you do if you're an engineer? You declare success on what's good, and you say it's somebody else's problem on what's bad. And that's exactly what we did. We created a two-stage approach. And the ones we know were good, we ran it, right? So if, it, if the report, here, so here's the two pairings. If the report ran through here and it said it's not significant, we knew it was correct, right? It was doing great. If it said it's significant, we're either right or wrong. So the point of the matter is if it was not significant, we declared victory. If it said significant, we had to see if we were wrong or we were right. And what we decided to do was we decided to create another classifier only for the bad ones and see if that one can fix our problem, right? You tweak what doesn't work. But we're not very creative. And we don't want to build anything because it's hard. And if you try something unproven, that's really hard. You may fail. But if you take things that are actually known and you know how to, and you twist the way they're actually operating, you may actually do better than you think. So what did we decide to do? We decided to come up with a classifier, a simple SVM classifier, that has a large number of features. If you actually think of what the Institute of Future Health wants to do, is it wants to collect a large number of sensor readings and integrate it and get the right answers through. So what we decided to do, and this is not a new idea, is take a million different sensors and see if you can harness them to actually do things that they weren't intended to do, but to solve the problem that you want them to do. So we took a bunch of features. One set of features is service textual features. So those of you who do OmniDude search and natural language processing, any of that kind here? No one does natural language processing? Wow. Really? I'm impressed or surprised. 
Basically, surface level features, characters, words, sentences, so on and so forth. By the way, how many do know how to do foreign language search or foreign name search? Side interview. If you actually go to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, it's a very, the most popular museum, visited museum, I don't know, a popular visited museum in the United States. There's a section that does foreign name searching. I know it because I built it. Um, and all it does is these very simple hacks of structures of characters. And it works just fine. So surface level features don't, do not capture semantics, but they definitely capture a lot of information that's useful. So that's one feature. Another feature is called summarization. How many of you read? <laughs> OK, you're awake. Um, I've actually asked that so many, I've given a talk in a different country, and I said, how many of you read? Silence. How many of you breathe? Silence. How many of you actually are awake? Still silence. So I start walking, and somebody goes, somebody goes, professor? So I knew at least one person was awake. But summarization features basically encapsulate, and you can compare how well one summary, it compares, it's got measures of how well one summary represents the next. So if you consider the final report as the end all gold standard, and you take the preliminary report as the beginning of it, and you compare the two of them, if it's a high score, i.e. it summarizes well, then they're very similar, right? Then it's less significant. If it doesn't summarize well, that means that something along the way doesn't match, and therefore you need to fix it. So that means it was poor some. So there's another set of features. And of course, these are the different uh, scenarios and flavors. You could also take machine translation features, right? So there's surface level, there's summarization, there's machine translation. If I want to translate from uh, English to German, so I could say, good morning, I'd say, good morning, and you'd say, good morning, you'd say, fine, okay. Or, hello, and you'd say, hello, same word. But you can do many different things, right? You can, but what if you were to translate English into English, or report into report? They should match. They should have a scoring mechanism of how well they match. Well, we take that scoring mechanism too. So we compare the two of them they, does one translate to the other? Is it the same translation? By the way, you should actually try translating the word time flies and see what happens when you do it to a foreign language. Anybody want to just do it and you'll see, you'll find it. So here's another value set of features. And again, many different flavors. And not to be outdone, there's the readability. Most of us, if you write a technical paper, you want to write it for sixth grade reading level. That's about four grades above my reading level. But the, the goal is that you write it in a certain, and every, there are well-known scoring mechanisms that tell you about what the readability is of the stuff. These are also metrics that affect how well is the quality of your, of your information. So now we've got surface level, which is just how it looks. We've got summarization, we've got translation, we've got readability. These are all a large number of features. And when you take them all together and you score it as a classifier, you run into the results. So how well are the results? Well, these are the standard level of what was done in the past. And the, basically, it is a either surface level or radiological or the like. These are the things that you understand immediately that should work without any second classifier, just the first classifier, or the it's better than the past, but it's not significantly better than the past, because it's vocabulary. These are all the combination of the different things that we actually tried. And if you actually look at it, if you mix everything together, Rouge and blue and meteor and red lex and these are all the surface. These are all the combination readability and lexicon and machine translation and so on and so forth. They are statistically significantly better than any other approach that's been out there. It automatically tells you if the difference is significant or not significant, and it works. So what we did was we found out that we actually can 
detect it because the second qual classifier will save us if the first classifier is wrong. So as I said, here are the combinations that we did. Of course, the best overall is when you combine it all. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking. Um, we obviously can show that it works very well because our false, and would you like to guess which one I'm, I am? The false negative rate is the lowest, and it's very important to have a false negative rate because you don't want to say it's okay, I mean, it's not, and it's vice versa. We obviously can use other metrics because if you want to publish it, you need to have lots of other metrics. And if you want to sell it to some, the person who's going to actually fund you, you want to show other metrics. And if you're not happy with those metrics, you show those metrics. And you show that indeed, in every case, you're doing better. And of course, it's important that not only do you look at the impression or the finding, you want to look at the all so that you can combine the whole thing and you can show that your approach really works. But the reality is when you actually go to deploy it, people don't care if it works. What do people care? How many of you want to ever start a startup? You want to have a startup. What's the first thing you better do to, to make sure that people care? People are ne always happy when things go well. Nobody has a problem when things go well. And if you do well 99% of the time, they're going to hate you for that 1% of the time you didn't do well. Because the cardinal notion is people get more upset when the one thing that doesn't go well if you ride that elevator 100 times every, for 100 days, and that one day you come in and the elevator's not working, you're going to curse that elevator, I guarantee you. And you're only on the third, actually, now we're on the fourth floor. You'll still curse it. So the first thing, the most important things we want to know is when we did what we did poorly. What we did poorly is the false positive and the false negative. The false positives is um, if you basically start a preliminary report and you just ramble on and on and on and on and on about everything under the sun, that's totally irrelevant. The rainstorm that I went through today, I went to visit somebody on the other side of the campus and the person picked me up to go bring me there and she says, it's raining. I'm like looking and saying, what? where's the rain? <laughs> And if you talk about all the rain showers that you had in Irvine and you tack it on, our system will tell you it's significant, different. Why? Because it's going to show a huge difference. The summary is not going to work. The translation is not going to work. The service feature. So if it's unnecessarily long and off target and the final report is correct, that's going to be a problem. Another problem is very, very subtle nuances. So if I tell you that there's worsening airspace disease at the left base represents aspiration, and I say, and I add the word could. Now could is a minor word. Nobody pays attention to words like could, right? Because this is not a medical term, it's not. So this is actually a serious problem, but we don't get it. So those are two things. Right now, a prototype's actually in operation and data records being collected in MedStar. MedStar is a, depending on the day, it's the largest uh, medical provider in the, the mid-Atlantic. The reason I say depending on the day is they're the largest and then Johns Hopkins buys a hospital, so not Johns Hopkins is the largest and MedStar gets very annoyed, so they buy a hospital, so they're the largest. So one of these days, MedStar is the largest in the mid-Atlantic, but it's, it's one a big player. And it's actually being deployed. I showed you there's a radiologist on the team that's being deployed. So that's the first talk. So that's part one. And we actually show that it worked. So the first component of computing medicine is something that we hoped would work. We took and twisted and turned different evaluation metrics to be able to use it for an application that it was not meant to do. We were not meant to use those as features, but we did, and it turns out to make a difference. The next one is much shorter and much simpler. And this one I guarantee was going to work, but it needs a background. So many, many years ago, many years ago, I ran into a urologist at Northwestern. So that was in Georgetown. This is Northwestern. I ran into a urologist at Northwestern, and he was very, very proud of himself. And I'm talking many, many years ago. And that doesn't show how many years ago. And he was very proud of him. Why was he very proud of himself? Because he came and told me 
that he col that he collects urine samples. Now, most of us may not be so happy to collect urine samples, but he was very happy to collect the urine samples. And he puts them in a database. So I asked him, what do you do with them? He said, I store them. So I'm waiting for the next sentence. No, next sentence. I said, OK, so after you store what do you do with them? He said, I store them. Well, as you can guess, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing getting any further. So I said, why don't you mine them? And he says, what? I said, mind them. I said, why do you care about them? He goes, well, because urinary tract infections are very, very resistant to medication. And the reason being is, again, the doctors are not going to have my stipend. Because when you go to a urinary tract, when you, when you think you've got a urinary tract infection, you go to a urologist, which, by the way, is the very, very lucrative uh, medical component of hospitals. You go to a, urinary, to a urologist, and the urologist says, here's, some here's antibiotics, go away. And they take a urine culture, and in three days, you either come back and say, either you don't come back, in which case you're fine, or you have a problem, by that time he, knows what, he or she knows what ails you and gives you the right antibiotics. But because of that, because the medications are handed out so frequently, there's a huge degree of resistance. And what happens is if you have a huge degree of resistance, the next person comes around, it doesn't help. So the question is, could you predict which ones were going to be a problem? Which patients were going to be resistant to which medications you would prescribe? And the way that they usually treat them is they usually follow a diseases guideline. Infectious, Society, Infectious Diseases Society of America gives guidelines, and they, you follow those guidelines. And they come out once a year. What's the problem with them coming once a year? They're six months out of date on average. So you're OK if you, they came out last week and you just got the disease now. But if you're now 11 months into the year cycle, not going to help you. So what we said was really simple. And it's a very important disease. It happens quite often. There's 8 million people that have it, 8 million doctor visits a year. What we basically said was instead of having the presumptive notion, can we predict emerging resistance? And the answer was rather simple. We just collected a whole bunch of their information and we mined it. We didn't do anything innovative. We t it turned out we took all the information in their medical record and we had it predict what is the right thing to do. We took including where they work and their, and their symptoms and the prior prescription and everything else. We threw it all together and we uh, mined the results and it worked. Now, I'll show you how it worked in a second. But you say, big deal. Everybody could have known that, except not in 2001. In 2001, when we proposed to do it, the guy was involved with the NIH. He was on their board, actually. And they flew in in August of 2001. It's very important, the date. In August 2001, they flew in to tell us to go, he asked him to come, the manager came, we gave a presentation. They said, this is really great, we're gonna sole source you money. But those of you who have dealt with the government, they know that in August, you don't have a dime. If you needed a dime, you're about 20 cents short. Because the government had no money in August. But come October 1, they're swimming in cash. So come October 1, we will get money. They said, we will source you the contract in October 1. Now, for those of you who actually follow dates, August 2001, we were the head of the world. September 11th, 2000, September 12th, 2001, they couldn't care less if we existed. Because unless you were selling bioterrorism, you weren't getting funded. And we weren't selling bioterrorism. After all, we were just treating women. We were just, your tract infections is for women. Two thirds of all. Two thirds of all the women between the age of 16 and 65 in the United States will suffer from a urinary tract infection. One third will suffer recurrent, i.e., more than two episodes in two or more episodes in six months, and we weren't. But so it was shelved. But Northwestern's a smart institution. How many of you have heard of Northwestern? <laughs> they have a lousy football team, but they're in a great location. At least the medical school is really in a great location. It's in downtown Chicago, the Gold Coast. But what does a smart institution do if they've got a system that they think is going to make an impact, 
but they're not able to actually get money or do it right now. They patented it. And in 2001, they filed two patents, one on the kits and methods to deal with it, and the other one to how to deal with mining it. It took forever long to get it issued because you can imagine that um, the institute, basically the patent office, said, all you're doing is mining. But it turns out it wasn't all you're doing is mining. It was very early on because it takes several years for them to look at it. By the time they started looking at it, mining became popular. So eventually they were issued. Immediately Northwestern tried to field test it and see what's going on. And they did, and they came up with a very, very, very simple and simplistic association rule mining algorithm that says, do you have a previous culture? No, stick nitrofuranthin. You do, and this algorithm. Okay, very simple algorithm. Why do we care? Because what happens is the guidelines basically predicted and worked 75% of the time. Uh, our algorithm worked 76.7% of the time. Now, big deal, it is statistically significant, but it's only a measly little 1.4% of 8 million of three days suffering or approximately 1,000 person years, 1,000 person years per year if it was applied nationwide. Northwestern got very excited. The doctor gave a very, was invited to give keynotes to American Urology Society. The doctor gave interviews on television. The doctor called it the Schaefer method. There's no freeder on that method. There is a patent. And he never lied. Northwestern introduces the Schaefer method and he agreed. So I hate doctors. <laughs> anyway. Make a long story short, this is straight out engineering. I didn't do anything innovative. I just was the right time, the right place for the right thing. But it shows you that if you solve, if you take different tools in one domain and put it in another domain, it works. You, there's no trending, there's no mining, there's nothing there. That just works. The most, I don't want to say innovative, um, the most researchy of all things is basically can you detect surveillance? Um, can you detect a outbreak of diseases in an early sector? Now these are their affiliations today. That's not their affiliation when they did the work. Um, John Parker was at Johns Hopkins in Georgetown. Uh, Andrew Yates was not, was not in Max Planck. He was a student in, in the Georgetown. And Alex Coates was head of special project for Twitter at the time. What it is, is simply said, public health surveillance is difficult. It demands a lot of human efforts. It basically is often delayed. It's not a very easy thing to do. And what happens is the way that people usually find out the disease is an outbreak. So you, you go to a doc, person, the patient goes to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, you look, you're sick. Oh, yeah, I am sick. Well, here's some medication, go home. It's an aspirin syndrome, go to sleep. Next patient comes in, doctor says, hey, you know you're sick. I said, yeah, you got this cold. He said, here's some aspirins, go home. And eventually the doctor says, you know, normally I only get 10 of these a week. Now I've gotten 25, I better report it. And enough doctors do the same, and eventually they say, oh, there's an epidemic. But wouldn't it be much nicer if you could actually do this with social media? Because social media is a panacea for everything nowadays. In the, now, in the past, they said, oh, yes, we need to collect. And all of a sudden, companies like Twitter come about. They start broadcasting information. People start trending them. And then, oh, and behold, wow, they can tell everything. They can detect everything. They're the holy grail for everything. The problem with them is that most people actually misuse what they actually do because they take a known problem and they say, can Twitter tell us the truth about this problem? And the answer is no, it can't. Because what happens is, if you already know what you're looking for, then you already are checking for it. And Twitter lies. And what I mean by Twitter lies is Twitter can find you what you're looking for if you're looking for it 
and it may or may not be right. What you could like to do is have Twitter tell you maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's a situation. And you'll see more what I mean in a second. So our view is that you can take social media data and it can generate you hypotheses. It cannot answer your question, but it can tell you there might be something wrong. And then you should go check it with something that's real. But if it gives you a quick early warning syndrome, it may give you false warnings. But at least if it gets you somewhere, you may be able to guide your way. But don't count on it to actually tell you the truth. So in the past, people used to say, hey, is there flu in Twitter? And the answer is yes, there's flu. We saw it in Twitter. But what you really like it to say is, is there something going on? And it says, yeah, there is. It's the flu. And that's a little nuance that makes a difference. So we have a Twitter corpus. It was collected actually by Johns Hopkins. It basically was two billion tweets. We had a large vocabulary. We took the, voca the, we took the tweets. We partitioned it by time. We did a simple mining of terms. So we found certain frequent word sets. We wanted to see, is it trending? You know what trending is. If it's trending, it's important. If it's not trending, it's just commonplace, i.e., has it changed? We translated it into real medicine because nobody uses medicine on Twitter. We translated the vocabulary, and then we told you, hey, listen, pay attention to this. So step by step, we took two billion tweets. We filtered out the garbage out of it. it you notice it's 1.6 million. It tells you how much garbage is in Twitter. We partition it by time. As I said, we cleaned up the vocabulary a bit. We found the item sets. So here are five example tweets. Pounding, headache, sore throat, low-grade flu, fever, sleep, a perfect cure for to get out of pain. Got you down, fever, muscle aches, cough, and so on. This morning I woke up with key. So those are three we created. We decided to get rid of anything that's got below a certain threshold. So the only thing that we cared about are flu and sore throat and fever. Example. We decided, is it trending? What does it mean, is it trending? Is it changed from last time? This time prime to that time to the current time prime. So here's two trends. As you can see, the decision I have to decide is what is trending. So the blue line is constantly higher, but it doesn't change much. It's just natural progression of flow. But the red line, so this is not very frequent. But allergies and so feel sick is common, but allergies and feel is trends in April and May. And it turns out that hay fever and things of the like occur in that time. It turns out that actually food illnesses that occur in that time. I didn't know why, but it does. But we take those two words and we run it through Wikipedia to try to see what it could map onto in terms of medical conditions. Why Wikipedia? By the way, Wikipedia is the answer to almost everything today in computer science. Why Wikipedia? Because that's the answer to everything in computer science. It's a translator. It takes Ophir vocabulary and translates to medical vocabulary. And you know the easiest way to translate? You're going to be very annoyed when I tell you how you do it. You know how you translate? Take Wikipedia. The way you translate a condition is if it's got an ICD code. If it maps, the, if you do a search on Wikipedia and it produces you something that has an ICD code, it's medical. You know why? Those of you who are not medical doctors, you know what's the most important thing about ICD codes? Spilling. Billing. Mm -hmm. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They may not care about other things, but billing they care about. I shouldn't give this talk in medical school. You should. <laughs> So if it maps onto a bill, but more than that, it tells you to a specific condition. So whatever these words, item sets that I find, it will map onto a condition. It will rank all of these conditions. So I now know that I'm talking about sore throat. If you look at what we did on flu, 
Don't worry about the fact the scale is different. This is the reality from the CDC. This is the reality from Twitter. It maps. So we were like very excited. Twitter solves the day. We can actually find its flu. We're all happy as can be. And we said, hurrah. Now you're going to see when we were doing some of this. The problem with social media is it kind of lies. How many of you actually remember the old show called the Colbert Report? <laughs> so in a while back, Twitter is actually very good at certain things. For example, the, when, the, when Scully landed a plane on the Hudson, Twitter reported it. And Twitter was the first to report it. And they reported it accurately. When in Thanksgiving 2008, I remember it very clearly. Thanksgiving 2008, <coughs> I was, for various reasons, talking to a friend of mine. And he told me, I can't talk to you now. In fact, I have no idea what's going on. It's a disaster. I said, what are you talking about? Said, I go, I'll tell you later, the engine's broken. I'll tell you what engine in a second. I said, why do you, he goes, people are looking at this. We should be trending, today is Thanksgiving. Macy's, football, turkey, parade, alcohol. We're trending Mumbai on Twitter. Why in God's name are we trending Mumbai? We should be trending what people are really saying. Our algorithm is not working. Well, it was working because it was picking up the strong signals that came out of India because the Mumbai terror attack occurred. So Twitter is very good at certain things. And it also is pretty good at tweets. Problem is Twitter is not always so accurate when the Hurricane Sandy got a group of people were trying to communicate where they were meeting. It most part did okay, except it also picked a plane about 60 miles east of the meeting spot. And they were meeting on the shore. You know what the problem is 60 miles east of the meeting spot on the shore? How many of you know anything about the geographic of the United States? <laughs> Go 60 miles east on the shoreline of New Jersey? <laughs> You're in the middle of the water. You don't really care what's going on there. <laughs> so it was kind of okay for the most part. But the best part about it is when Michael Jackson died. When Michael Jackson died, it was reported on Twitter. But Twitter decided that why only kill Michael Jackson? They could also kill Jeff Goldblum. Now, those of you who don't know who Jeff Goldblum is, he's an actor. And the one thing about his death is it didn't happen because he's still alive. Now, I'm not going to get into anybody's religious beliefs. But scientifically stated, if he was dead then, he's probably still dead now. But he's alive now. So you can assume that he didn't die then. And he didn't. But it became so popular because Twitter killed him off. Because it was trended that he died on Twitter. Because people decided they were going to broadcast, and enough censors said Goldblum's dead. That Stephen Colbert on a Colbert report talked to Jeff Goldblum from the dead. So he actually brought him on the show, and he says, I'm now going to talk to the dead, to the afterlife. Because I'm talking to Jeff Goldblum as we speak. Jeff Goldblum says, I'm not dead. He says, you must be dead. Twitter killed you. You're dead. You're dead on Twitter. You're dead. So it's not quite accurate. So it has a little bit of problems. But we were comfortable with it and said, OK, there's some hope to deal with it. We played with, we played with uh, a bunch of different things. So here's an example of sinus. And you can imagine it does make sense. It sparks at that point. We tried with allergy response, and again, it spiked at the same. These are the terms we found. We found food allergy spiked, and again, it was the same. And then we decided to go and try to do it for real. And we talked to people at Twitter, and the head of Twitter special efforts said, we're going to deploy it for you. We're going to try to do it. Problem is, for those of you who have been following the woes of Twitter or the ups and downs of Twitter, um, that's when they decided to bring back the now current CEO for the day, uh, one of the founding f members who is, well, we'll leave my opinions alone. Um, and he reorganized Twitter. <clears throat> By reorganizing, it means he chopped. That's a fancy word for reduction in force, which is a fancy word for firing. Uh, and therefore, the ones who basically had enough money and said, you know what, I'm not dealing with this guy, and left. 
So it never got implemented. But we actually wanted to show that it would have some potential value. And in fact, the reason I'm talking to you here is because it does have potential value. So the question is, <clears throat> welcome Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. So a little background for you. In the summer of 2014, there was a huge problem on people's hands, and that was an unanticipated epidemic of EVD-68, whatever that is, it's a, vi a virus. And this virus caught the entire Midwest off guard. And what happened was that their prediction of the situation and how many beds were necessary and how many people needed to be treated was so out of kilter that many hospitals didn't have enough beds, a lot of pharmacies didn't have enough drugs, and that was a real big problem. So they said, oh my God, we better never have to suffer that again. What are we gonna do? Well, you know, when somebody's in desperation mode, you can actually sell them a lot of things a lot quicker. So sure enough, we were gonna sell them on Twitter. And the goal was, if you could predict ahead of time, what is the likely problem of an outbreak? You can quote unquote have better staffing, better space management, better supplies, better veterinary instructions, better every plan you can do, as long as you knew ahead of time you can plan to have enough staffing and coverage, you can procure enough drugs, and you can warn the people of the, base of the susceptible population, hey, wake up. So, the question is, can we predict it? And now the first response is, of course you can. You don't need any of this stuff, because we know that it's basically a seasonal effect. Well, these are the different years of when it spiked. And in case you can't see it, this does not align with this, does not align with that, and these never spiked. So it, there is no season, <coughs> unless you consider every week different, the same. So if you consider every month the same, every week the same, doesn't matter when it occurs, you can see it doesn't spike. So seasonal effects are not really good. Um, and the question is, and you know who are the at-risk population? Young children, adults of 65 years of age, pregnant women, and so on and so forth. But you can imagine that there's what's called a sponsor. And who is the hospital I'm working for now, we're dealing with? No, Cincinnati, yes, but Cincinnati what? Children's. Children's. So they don't really care about adults over 65 years. Sorry. They are less interested in, in the interest of these individuals, but they care a lot about young children. Um, and basically, you basically cannot predict when it's occurring, but Twitter is exactly what they're looking for. Why? If you look at the demographics of who is the biggest users of Twitter, it's really between the ages of 18 and 29 or 18 and 30, 49 era. Those are the big, now what, are about, what do you know about facts of life? That's when they have babies. It's the facts of life, that's when there are babies. And more of the fact, what do you know about the people using Twitter? They're the mothers of those babies. And the one that you can be sure of is when a parent is sick, saying, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, the likelihood is the baby will be sick. And if the baby is sick, they'll also talk about the baby being sick. And what does that tell you for Cincinnati children's? That demographic is the one that's gonna be dealing with the people who are getting sick. If you can spark that demographic geographically tagged, which of course you can do by the IP address, you can predict what's going to happen with the demographics. So if you look at what happened in that time frame, in the Chicago area, it was big. In the Pittsburgh area, which is not the far less important because it's Chicago and this is Pittsburgh, it was also big. Now we're in Cincinnati, never mind. Um, <clears throat> and we looked at a clinical study and said, can we use it to predict what is going on? And if you actually look at it, if you just take very simple vocabulary, nausea, nauseous, coughing, wheezy, and you basically deal with all the tweets in the 50 mile radius of Cincinnati, you, and you only looked at those that dealt with certain ICD-9 codes, could you predict when a spike was and would it predict it correctly? So we collected a whole bunch of social media, 
these are just examples. Say, I'm tired of coughing. Um, the headache, 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 stop, stop, stop. Um, Non-stop headache for three days. I hate sneezing. Um, think I might be getting the flu, so on and so forth. You can get those along the way. We found out that out of the 27, 30, 2800 tweets about the headache was at 53.8 of them and so on and so forth. These are where the core. We looked at the correlation of results between when the spikes occurred in those vocabulary and we looked at the statistical significance on it and yeah, we actually did know exactly when five days and three days and two days ahead of time with certainty of uh, proper confidence of when there's going to actually be a uh, spike. So Cincinnati House was very happy with it and they're playing with the prototype right now. And I don't have results yet because they haven't had an epidemic that they say, hey, this found yet, either because they didn't have an epidemic or they didn't find it. But in any case, that's what it is. It's actually being targeted as we speak. I talked to you initially about the range between engineering and research. I told you the really, really, really simple data mining on really, really obvious things actually can help you not have suffering and get the resistance down of, of antibiotics. That's in Northwestern. I talked about a prototype that's in deployment right now at MedStar uh, on basically being able to make sure that there won't be any errors done in your diagnostics, that you'll be able to take care of it correctly that everything should work just fine in radiology, and that's being deployed. And I showed you that even though social media lies, it lies enough, it tells enough the truth that if you actually geographically tag the location, you will be, and you geographically search and clearly filter out the vocabulary, you'll be able to do prediction that actually makes sense. Now, those are all computerized techniques. Those are all automated. Those are all predicted for medicine. And they're all really, 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 really simple computing. If I can understand it, it has to be simple, and I make it as simple as possible. Now, every talk I talk, I follow three guiding principles, because I really believe in those three guiding principles of the talk, about any talk. And if you take anything away from this talk, Take these three guiding principles. Number one, always finish on time. <laughs> because if you don't finish on time, they will basically think you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know how to organize your talk. You can, because the cardinal rule, if you can't say it in the amount of time you're allocated, you don't know how to say it. So number one, always finish on time. Rule number one. Rule number two, always leave time for questions. And the reason you have to leave time for questions, if you don't leave time for questions, people think, this guy didn't want any questions because he's afraid they're gonna ask me questions I don't know, and therefore I don't wanna leave time for questions. I'll just go into the very last second. And, okay, so leave question, root time for question. Let's go into it. Guideline number three, that's the most important of all guidelines. Never leave much time for questions, because if you do, they will ask the question you don't know, and you, they will know you don't know anything. So it is now 4.59. I left exactly one minute for questions. Are there any questions? There was a, a very famous paper that Google had published. On Google, yes, and they Google flew. flew. Google flew. And it was published in a big journal, no name. Science. I know. And uh, then they And showed it, yes, because they were doing things that are wrong. Right. So, so what, why, is, why is what you're doing not wrong? Yeah. The cardinal rule is very simple. What Google said was, we are going to search our, after the news announcements and stuff, that they, they're going to bolster the information. They relied on their information as gospel truth. They said that if we can detect any correlation, it must be occurring and hence the flu spike, because their own news broadcasts and so on and so forth. It was announced. I'm not telling you at all that what we do in Twitter is going to be true. In fact, I said it many times, it is a indicator. If it shows that there's a spike, something's afoot. Is it a spike because somebody 
is talked about in the news and a lot of people are tweeting about it? Or is it because there really is a spike? It's just something you should check out. And yes, it will give you a lot of, potentially give you a lot of false positives. But if your children in Cincinnati Hospital that had an epidemic that you couldn't feel because you didn't know ahead of time that you're getting an epidemic because no one said it, you're willing to take the price of having certain beds available, certain drugs ordered, certain staff on call. So the answer is I can't prove to you that it's right and I don't know it's right. I'm telling you it's something you should try to verify by other sources, such as people going to a doctor and so on and so forth. You're saying that Google assumed their search term queries were all ground truth? Yes, they assume that what they're finding is what people are doing about themselves as opposed to looking for information about others or what's available. So, I mean, you're saying the problem is more interpretive than in the model itself? The problem is you should understand that what you're doing is you're flagging trends. And the same as Jeff Goldblum isn't dead, by the way, neither is Madonna. She was also killed at the same time. Um, the fact that they're not dead indicates that there are trends that are wrong. I, can t I know very, very well how Twitter trends work. Don't worry about why, but I know very, very well that Twitter trends really what it does. It's a very simple algorithm that's extremely efficient that does a very good job. But it has its problems. And if it's gamed, you're going to have a problem. Like every optimization system, if you game it, you'll solve the other problem. Is the problem fundamentally that... Ah, uh, uh, wait, it's over. Sorry, you're done. <laughs> Go ahead. Is the problem fundamentally that if you use only one source, and that is noisy, then you have to spend a lot of effort to clean the noise. If you start using multiple sources, then they uh, start helping each other in finding signals from noise. The reason that the project that we are deployed, and the reason there were lots of features in this data mining algorithm, is we expect that a lot of the features are going to be flawed. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, if you actually watch those game shows and the like that says, ask the audience, the audience probably doesn't know 99% of what you ask, but the one, the most popular answer, the ones that they converge on, is almost always correct. Because if you're going to err, you're going to err for different reasons. But if you're going to get it right, if I asked you how much is 2 plus 2, the popular answer is going to be 4. You may have 5, 6, and 7. I won't ask people. I won't embarrass them. But the popular answer will be 4. And that's the reason you use lots of sensors, because when they err, they don't air the same way. When they're correct, they usually convert to the right answer. So if you want to combine Twitter with some other sensor, what would you use? Well, we actually combined, we wanted to combine it with a pharmaceuticals. Um, if there's a uptick in purchase things in CVS and Walgreens and the like, mm -hmm. that's what they're probably gonna do. Mm -hmm. But that's not my problem. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling any of these things. Mm -hmm. Schaefer method was fielded by Schaefer. Um, this is done by MedStar, and that's done by Cincinnati Children's. <laughs> Any other questions? Even though you guys are way too late. Thank you. Thank you.